Can everybody see that the my screen that says Star Trails? Yeah. Woohoo. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I will full disclosure this this presentation. I wrote this presentation, but I use so there, there's there's a lot of Andrew's photos in it. But I was usually standing right next to him when he was doing these, so I think that counts. So, so we're going to cover kind of we're going to cover two ways um, to photograph the night sky. Uh, one is just a single exposure. Um, which is more like Milky Way. Um, and then if we do a whole bunch of single exposures in a row, we can make star trails. So we'll, we'll talk about both. Uh, I figure why not? So we're gonna talk about the math, the art and then the gear. I don't know. Uh, and this is from another presentation where they needed to have my cell. But if you need my cell phone number, that's my cell phone number for whatever reason. Feel free to text me in the middle of the night. <laughs> hey, you up? Yeah, probably. Don't tempt me. <laughs> yeah, I don't sleep a lot. It's okay. Okay. So let's see. Hold on. I got to flip over. I, this chat is interesting. Hold on. How do I get to that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, do you want to? Yeah. Um, how will I share this? Um yeah put your if you want me to send you a copy of this presentation um oh man how do i do this so confused um yeah send just put your email in uh the chat and i'll i'll do a big share from here is that easy josh you can actually do it pretty easily from the website just go to send email to members and you can put an attachment on the email uh but it's not an attachment it's a google drive file Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll just start that. So yeah, just put your, put your email in the chat and I'm going to sign, I'm going to sign you up for some really awful newsletters. I mean, I'll send you this. That was, that was a joke. <sighs> Ah. See how fast. Oh my gosh, y'all are so fast. Ah. E. Oh, sorry, I'm typing. I'm a guy. I can only do one thing at a time. Ah, hold on. Almost got you, Ed. Ed, I like your email. That's a good one. Ed at edpete.com. That's nice. Yeah, straight easy to, the, to remember. Straight into the point. Oh, we have two patties. Hi, hey, other patty. Hi, Patty Robertson. How are you doing? Ed, can we do uh, from WebEx? Does WebEx have an email to participants? Not that I know of. It might have it somewhere, but uh, well, I'm not but aware of it. <laughs> I have to share it from my Google Drive, or at least that's all I know. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Patty Robertson, I've been enjoying your backyard uh, quarantine uh, photos. Those have been good. Oh, joking that I would send uh, awful newsletters. I would sign y'all up. I would take all of these. and I've just harvested all your emails. I'm going to start sending you to you. The opposite, whatever political party you like, I'm going to sign you up for the opposite newsletter. Ah. Okay. Oh, well, we still got more coming. And extra, I know that one. Oof. Dude, my copy and paste skills going, though. Okay. Anybody else? Josh, I don't know how to do that. How to do what? How to type. Onto the chat. Uh, you open up the chat box. There's yes, it's open, but I don't see where you type it. Mm. It's only on the bottom. On the bottom? Yeah, below where it says to everyone. Just click in there. You can also do to owner. 
probably uh -huh. covered up by your toolbar when it pops up from the bottom. Oh. <laughs> How do I get rid of the toolbar without getting out of this? Uh, long discussion, but uh, in, instead reduce your your window so it's not maximum uh. size, and then it'll you'll your your bottom of your window will be above the toolbar. Uh oh. It's okay. Keep going. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hit send. If you figure out how to do it later, then okay. All right, that should have just gone out to everybody now. <laughs> I can hear everybody's notifications. <laughs> should we all uh, mute so we can pay attention to uh, Josh? Ears get hot, <sighs> sweaty ears. <sighs> Oh, I can see y'all logging in. That's fun. It's good. <clears throat> oh, another one. Ah. <laughs> no, no, Berlin. <laughs> that'd be that'd be too narrow of a uh, <laughs> of a contest. Okay, so in effect, when we're doing star trails, what we want to do is basically mimic what a film camera would do, which is open up your shutter for a long length of time. Um, but what we have to do because of technology and sensor heat and some other issues, um, we typically want to do 30 second exposures, but continuously taking them. Uh, so if we're doing a star trail, we want the effect of opening our sensor up for, you know, an hour, two hours, four hours. Um, but uh, we want to do them in 30 second chunks um, so that um, the sensor doesn't overheat and some other things. There are people who add like uh, gaming cooling systems to their cameras to do deeper uh, photography to keep their sensor cooler. Um, what tends to happen if your sensor overheats your camera sensor, that's when you start getting like dead pixels and really overdone noise and some other stuff. So um, for Milky Way, you know, in general, we're going to be doing a 30 second exposure, um, you know, more or less. Um, or at least that's a good starting spot. It may be brighter than that, but probably isn't. So, OK, but I think that's just a good visual of like a dotted line. Now, I, I will say for one of the things on the camera that you don't want to do, uh, it's just one of those like weird camera settings, but um, you don't want to have um, dark frame subtraction. So a lot of times if you're like at a high ISO or you're doing a really long exposure, you're by default, a lot of cameras are set up to take two photos. They'll take one uh, with what you want to shoot, and then they'll do another one with a black frame to subtract that to help the noise. Um, that will make shooting very annoying though. And I would turn that off in your various cameras. Um, I would have to see, I don't remember where, where it is on everybody's. Um, yeah. So cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like Canon has a modified R it's called the RA where it has a different, uh, filter on the front to make it more sensitive to the, the colors of the night sky. So that's kind of cool too. Yeah, every now and then Canon will make like a specific version for astrophotography. I would recommend you don't shoot portraits with it though, because one of the things it does is change the red wavelength um, and human skin is red. So it does some really weird things. Um, yeah, it's a very specialized tool. <clears throat> okay. So in general, one of the things that is odd about shooting at night um, is it feels like you're out forever and you get home and you might have only taken like eight photos <laughs> um, because by the time you get focused and um, you know everything else uh, and then your exposures are 30 seconds each um, you know it might feel like you've been out for a long time and I always come home with way less photos than I think I shot um, so 
if you want to take multiple compositions, um, especially if you're doing star trails, you will need multiple tripods and multiple, sh you know, you need parallel gear, um, you know, if you're doing star trails. Um, star trail season is kind of September to March, and Milky Way season is kind of April through August. Um, and the only reason it's that is because, well, a couple reasons. One, the Milky Way, well, we're in the Milky Way, um, but the Milky Way in the Northern Hemisphere is visible basically in the summer months, plus a little bit, um, where in the Southern Hemisphere, it's obviously the opposite. Uh, but it's where that fat galactic core is that's in all the photos. So they're, they're, for the Milky Way itself, there's certainly a, um, a very specific time of the year we can do it. The hard part is um, as the nights get longer or as the days get longer, when the Milky Way rises, um, especially if you're in higher and higher latitudes, it'll already be up by the time the sun is set. Um, so there's definitely some like math that goes into like when to go shoot. Now, in general, in general, you want to go probably the new moon plus or minus a day um, because those are the darkest sky and you want dark skies so that the skies, the stars themselves pop off against that. As you get more and more light, you're losing contrast, essentially. You're raising the ambient light, and the stars are harder and harder to see. Um, so really, the moon is, like a full moon, is kind of the nastiest time to shoot, and then new moon is the best time to shoot. And it's a sliding scale from there. Um, but I find usually, you know, that kind of bell curve, you know, plus or minus two or three days on either side of new moon is probably your best bet. Um, you know, some of it is you're out pretty late at night, so, you know, make sure that, you know, you either go with a partner or you go someplace safe, someplace you've scouted um, in the daytime so you know where you're going, um, all those kind of things. You don't want to, especially in Texas, you don't want to cross people's fences late at night. Uh, they might get the wrong idea. Um, so please don't get shot. <laughs> um, yeah. So with Star Trails, yeah, you know, if you're having, if you're having a camper room for an hour or two, yeah, axe murder, exactly. If you have a camera running for an hour or two and you want to do multiple compositions during that same time, you're going to need parallel gear. You need multiple tripods, multiple cameras, multiple shutter releases, multiple wide-angle lenses, multiple memory cards, all that kind of good stuff. Um, for me, I find the sweet spot for star trails, for me, this is just what I like, somewhere around like an hour to two hours. You can certainly go longer, um, but I actually I like mine a little more staccato. Um, I don't like them doing the full loops. I just don't find that as interesting as, um, oh yeah, sorry. <clears throat> there, is that better? Is that better? Um, so yeah, I, I just, you know, just think about that. You know, if you're, if you're just starting out, um, you know, one camera, one tripod, one, one wide angle lens is probably fine. Um, but as you step up your game, just you're going to have to think in like parallel terms. So that's kind of a new thing to think about. Very rarely are you shooting multiple cameras. Um, you know, uh, where and when to get full arch mark Milky Way shot. Yeah. So those are panoramas, um, unless you're shooting with a fisheye. Um, those are generally panoramas. Um, I'm actually going to be trying some of that out this weekend. Um, well, I'm doing something completely crazy. I'm I'm doing long lens stitched panoramas to emulate large format wide angles haha -ha. um but yeah generally it's it's probably like a two by four grid um to make a um the full art shot um and you want to wear you well first of all you have to go somewhere where you can see the entire arch um so you don't want to have a lot of trees that's why like the american southwest is really nice because there's not a lot of trees um, and you don't want buildings or anything. Your other nemesis is going to be planes. Um, the, the transponder lights of planes, you're going to be Photoshopping those out and they're very annoying. Um, yeah, you'll see them. You, you don't realize how many planes are in the air until you start photographing the night sky. And then you realize just immediately how many planes are in the sky at any given point. Um, uh, Joshua tree is really good. Actually, I've done some really fun Joshua tree stuff. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to more of that. So let's talk about the night sky. Uh, one of the first big ahas that I had is realizing that the night sky is something like tungsten. It's not exactly tungsten, um, but, but it's closer. 
Yeah, right now there are less planes. Yeah, um, yeah, there are actually. That's a good point. Um, the color temperature is tungsten, and what that tells you is um, if you're going to be doing any sort of light painting or using a flash or strobe mixed in with your Milky Way shots to make sure to gel your daylight balance light wands or strobes to tungsten. So add like a CTO to them so that the light is right. Um, because what happens like on my first couple light paintings, I didn't know that the night sky was tungsten and I was using daylight balance strobes and my foregrounds were either very orange or like a weird sickly color blue. And so that's kind of the first thing that I like to tell people is the night sky is tungsten. Um, and that's a really nice thing to know. The other thing too, going from daylight to tungsten, you lose about a half stop of exposure. So if you're shooting in daylight and you're trying to judge from the back of your screen, it's actually going to look brighter than when you convert it to tungsten later uh, because tungsten is uh, less reds and the cameras, one third of what they shoot is red spectrum. Uh, so yeah, just something to kind of consider. I would make sure, I, I usually either put it in tungsten white balance or fluorescent white balance um, just to, to mimic kind of what I'm actually seeing. Um, the other thing, uh, the color temperature of the sky changes um, as different gases are released uh, during the night. So maybe at the beginning of the night, it's a little warmer. And then by the end of the night, it's a little greener, which is why I might use fluorescent, like if I'm waking up early to do one, um, just depending on when the Milky Way is rising and setting versus when the moon is rising and setting versus when the sun is rising and setting, which is why I use an app like PhotoPills to track all that stuff, because it can be a lot to keep track of as we look at the celestial bodies above us. Okay. Um, Polaris, which is the North Star, right? Kind of the guiding light. If you've ever seen a star trail, there's kind of a dead spot in the center, and that's Polaris. That's the North Star. Um, and it makes it very obvious why um, that was the navigational star to know, right? If you knew where Polaris was, you knew how to navigate on the seas because it was the only one relative to our positions didn't move. Um, and once you see a star trail with that circle, you're like, oh, yeah, those other ones would be very unreliable. Uh, so that's a good one. Um, airplanes do suck. Um, you're going to do a lot of photoshopping of uh, transponder beacons. Um, and the Earth rotates. And we just don't think about that a whole lot. And I know everybody knows that logically. Um, but it starts to come into account for things like how long of an exposure can you have with different focal lengths for uh, getting the right exposure without the stars moving. Uh, so the longer the focal length you go, basically, the shorter shutter speed time you can have. So let's say you're shooting at 16 mil, you know, 30 seconds, no problem. You start getting to like 50, 85, you're going to want to be, you know, maybe under five seconds because you're shooting a smaller piece of the sky. And so the apparent motion is faster. Um, think about like if you're shooting a runner, um, if you're shooting a runner, somebody running very fast or like a fast moving car and you were shooting with a wide angle, like the, the apparent motion isn't very much. Uh, but if you're shooting with a super telephoto, right, they move a foot and it might be out of your frame. Does that kind of make sense as an analogy? But the, we're, we're rotating very quickly, right? So just know that there's a 500 rule. Um, I don't really understand it. I just punch it into a calculator and I figure it out. But um, yeah, there you go. 900 miles an hour. So pretty quick, you know, faster than I can run. Um, so, you know, if you're shooting wide angle, anything like 24 mil or under, you're safe with 30 second exposures. But once you start getting above like 35 mil, uh, you're really going to start to notice a, a ramp down in the times you can use, um, to get a Milky Way shot. Um, so I'm going to be doing an 85 millimeter shot this weekend. And I think my exposure times are going to be, need to be somewhere between like two and a half seconds and five seconds. Uh, just because any faster, if, if I let it go any longer, the stars are going to be blurry and i don't want blurry stars also uh it kind of goes without saying but i'll say it anyway um clouds are problematic <laughs> um you can't see the milky way if there's a big cloud in front of you <laughs> um now clouds can be interesting yeah i'll get to that steven um i have a general formula here in a second um clouds are very interesting uh, they can add some foregrounding low-lying clouds can be really nice to give like some depth and dimension to photos um, but in general, a cloudy night is not going to be a night. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Lewis, exactly. Photopills does have that. Um, uh, anyway, clouds can be, you want clear skies. Um, clear skies are kind of what you want um, in general. 
um, the moon, right? We don't want the moon out, but also a sky map for like knowing where the Milky Way is going to be rising and setting, um, especially as you plan for uh, compositions. You want to make sure that you know which direction everything is going to be moving, uh, where the sun's going to be setting, where the moon's going to be rising, where the Milky Way is coming up. So uh, sky map, photo pills, uh, there's a bunch of them out there. Uh, Google has a sky map. Any of those things are useful. Uh, just kind of depends on, you know, what you want to spend. Photo pills is like 10 bucks or something like that. So um, anyway, yeah, that's a nice guy. Okay, so let's talk about some planning things. Um, you know, you want to check weather forecasts. And really the thing that matters is 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 clouds, um, you know, weather. You're just going to have to suck it up. If it's hot or cold, just go. Um, also, there is a little bit as it goes longer and you, the moisture levels rise. Um, you, you might see some fogging in your lens. Um, you might see some, um, like moisture build up on the front of the lens and that can be really annoying as well. Uh, so it also like in Texas, one of our problems, um, you know, we drive around the very air conditioned cars and then we get out to shoot and that temperature differential can fog up our lenses. So, you know, you kind of want to get where you're staring, where you're going to set up, open up your camera bag and let your lenses breathe so that they equalize with the, the ambient temperature. Um, I've, I've had to wait five or 10 minutes. Um, and then there's, there can be a lot of like, especially like a high humidity night, it can take forever for those things to like equalize so that you're not getting a huge uh, moisture buildup on the front of the lens. Um, also if you're doing longer exposures and like star trails, uh, batteries can be a real problem as well. Um, this is actually an area where mirrorless kind of runs into a little bit of a problem. Um, it's gotten better. Um, it used to be a little bit, a lot worse, but the batteries for mirrorless cameras have gotten a lot better, but when they first came out, they were eating so much more battery. Um, so you couldn't go very long with them. So there's some like, like external power packs and different things you can use. One of the cool things now, some of the cameras you can charge over USB. So you can set up like a power pack, uh, like a little USB power pack, and it'll help power it for longer. Um, so those are some of the things that you can do as well. Um, also cities, you want to be away from cities. And this is one of the reasons you need to know which direction you're going to shoot. So if you know you're shooting east, right, and we live in Austin area, you need to get north. Because if you're shooting east, you have to get north of kind of Austin, Colleen, Temple area. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of light pollution. Um, if you're going to be shooting west, it's a little bit easier, right? Um, you know, just go a little bit more west and it opens up really nice. Um, South is a little bit harder from here because you need to get south of like San Antonio. Um, so just kind of think about like where and like cities up to like 7,500 miles away will show up in your exposures. So you really need to like get out in the middle of nowhere as best you can. Um, also, if you're doing this for the first couple of times, I absolutely would recommend going in a group. Um, a, you're always going to forget a piece of gear. So it's good to have a buddy. Um, B, I mean, we're out in the middle of the night. Things happen, right? Safety. Just be safe. Um, solo trips or, you know, once you get a hang for it, you know, whatever. I go out by myself a lot, um, but be careful. Let people know where you're going to be. Tell them when you're going to be back. Um, all those things. I just want y'all being safe out there, okay? Um, and like I said, new moon plus or minus three days is that. Um, different patterns. I'm just going to uh, yeah. I'm just going to show you some, like, star trails so y'all get an idea of, like, what I'm talking about. So if we're pointed north, the trails rotate around the North Star, right? Uh, facing west, you start getting some of those dual curves. You get some swirlies, which is fun. Um, this is, yeah, I like, this is the type I like for star trails where it's a little bit more staccato, where the lines aren't full circles. Um, full circles take, you know, six to eight hours, depending on focal length. Um, so for me, hour and a half is kind of my goal when I'm doing uh, star trails. Um, and what's fun about star trails, like if you're like, like if you were going to go out and shoot this weekend, Milky Way doesn't come up to like 11, 11 ish. And so in that, that hour and a half, you can get a Milky Way composition done from the time the sun sets until the Milky Way comes up and then transition over to just shoot the Milky Way. So while you're waiting around, it's kind of a nice thing to have the camera running and doing, but also because you're doing that, make sure you bring extra batteries. Does that make sense? Bring like eight batteries with you and you'll, you'll be happy and a very sturdy tripod. <laughs> um, cheap tripods will end up being thrown in the lake after a night like this. So again, kind of pointed north, <laughs> a shorter one. This is downtown Austin. You can see how few stars you can see with 30 minutes. This is kind of an example of what light pollution will do, right? We just can't see the stars enough to make trails out of. 
uh, longer lens, everything is going to uh, move faster. You can see those are airplanes. How pretty. Uh, this is one of mine, and this is out in Dripping Springs. This is actually close to Pertinalis. I'm maybe only like 10 minutes from Pertinalis at this shoot. Um, and I put, I like to put people on my star trails because I'm crazy. Because that adds a whole nother level of like <laughs> difficulty. <laughs> uh, they were only in for one 30 second frame and I flashed them with two strobes. And then I let the, the camera run. And then it's a composite of the foreground that they're in and the background of the stars. But the camera never moved. So. So this is this is Enchanted Rock. So look at how dark the sky is at Enchanted Rock versus how dark it is at um, in Dripping Springs or west of Dripping Springs. Um, if that kind of gives you an idea of like why you'd want a dark sky, see how the stars are way more contrasty. The the shutter time was actually open about the same, um, and that's the moon setting in the middle of that exposure. Um, so I'm actually using one of my strobes to light up in the Enchanted Rock from Turkey Rock at like a quarter mile away. Uh, very soon after this frame was popped, the park rangers did come and talk to us and like, boy, what in the hell are y'all doing? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. Because um, I was firing an, an, a 640 watt flash at full power at midnight. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, but that's the only way I could get an exposure on the Enchanted Rock behind them. And this is out in Joshua Tree where we're, we're, we're strobe painting the Joshua tree to get it. Um, otherwise, it would just be a silhouette. Okay. So here's our basic camera setting. Now, this setting is, is, is my starting point um, for um, star trails, but it's also the same for Milky Way. So in general, white balance, tungsten, ISO 1600, F4, 30 seconds. Um, that's, that's my general setting. Um, I've gone as high as, uh, 12,000 ISO. I've gone as low as like 800 ISO, depending on what I may be doing something different with my F stop, right? I might be shooting at F2. I might be shooting at five, six. Um, so just know that, um, you know, you can play with those, but that's kind of my general starting point. Um, yeah. Also yeah. know your uh you you want to see it where it's just not black lewis um so you want to see it where that left edge is just off the edge um anything from there but you don't also you don't want to blow out the stars um so you want to see things like middle and left now the caveat to that and that's what i was about to say is know your camera manufacturer so like for me i'm a cannon shooter and it, what's weird my 5d3 i had to expose more to the right um and on my left, I mean, on my 5D4, I can expose more to the left to protect my highlights more. My 5D4 can expose the shadows better than my 3 did. So know your camera manufacturers. They're all a little different. Uh, I don't see any motion at 20 mil, but that, that's me. Um, I don't see any motion when I'm at 16, 20, 24. I'm safe at all those. Um, now, what you may be seeing isn't what you might be seeing is not motion. You might be seeing coma, C-O-M-A. Uh, some lenses um, don't render the light points as circles. Then they they render them as more like obelisk. David, send me an example. Uh, text me an example. Uh, here, text it to me so I can see it on my phone because I can't bring it up on my computer right now. Uh, but text me like a... Um, here, here's my cell phone. Um, Yeah, text me a close up of what you're seeing because I'm curious. Um, I don't, yeah, I shoot at 24 all the time and I don't get any motion. Um, anyway, so for, for histogram, part of it is no, knowing your, um, okay, that's fine, um, is knowing your camera manufacturer. Some of them are more biased to the highlights, some of them are more biased to the shadows. But in general, you just don't want pure black because those are hard to, um, that's hard to bring up. It might not record any data. And then when you bring up the shadows, you're going to get banding. And so for most people, um, so you're going to want to make sure that that left side just has a little bit of data to it. The stars aren't really going to show up in the histogram uh, because they're so faint uh, parts of light. Um, they're not, you're not really going to see that in the histogram. Um, yeah, so 5D3. So yeah, 5D3 is interesting. Again, you have to expose to the right, so you have to get a little more exposure. So you may want to go from F4 to 2.8 to get everything more to the right-hand side of the histogram. 
Um, so, you know, something like, and I've used a bunch, but my, my current lens is a 16 to 35 F4. Um, but on the 5D3, I'd feel more comfortable with the 2.8. Um, yeah, I'd probably feel more comfortable with the 2.8 on a 5D3 just because it needs a little bit more light um, for me, for, for what I do. Um, because it doesn't recover the shadows as well as the 4 does. Um, you could get like the 14 2.8. It's a prime. That's really good. Um, what else would be a good one on that one? Um, Sigma makes like a 14... They make some crazy 14, like wide, like F2 or like 1.8 or something ridiculous. Um, this is also where something like, I'll type this in, but like lens rentals is really great. Um, or, even, or even precision to rent um, a wide angle lens. Um, either one of those is great. So you can try out lenses. Um, yeah, I would... Yeah, F4 on the 5D3 gets a little choppy because you're usually going to have to be at 3200 then to get the exposure more to the right, Gene. So, yeah, I'd look at something with a 2.8 or above. Um, actually, I, I use my 3514 a lot on my 5D3, and I shoot at F2, and that gives me a pretty good boost to my exposure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the things you definitely want to do, though, is turn off the camera noise reduction, and you want to turn off the dark frame Um there's a setting on all the cameras where it'll it'll do that. Um, some of them have it turned on. Some of them have it turned off by default. So just check. Uh, you'll notice it like you'll take a 30-second exposure, and then it'll take another 30-second exposure. And if you're doing a star trail, that's not great because then you're going to have gaps in your stars. Um, and even for Milky Way, that's, just, that's not the best practice for getting less noise reduction. Um, for noise reduction, you might want to take the same shot four times, and then you can average out the noise or... 12. If you have a tracker, you could do it even more, but um, there's some other ways to get rid of the noise that are better than doing the camera dark frame subtraction. Um, for star trails, basically I have a remote shutter release that I lock and I just lock it and let it keep shooting continuous frames for an hour, hour and a half, whatever. Um, and you you do <laughs> want to be, uh, yeah, you definitely want to be raw and you definitely want to put it in manual. Once you get your focus, however you get your focus, you definitely want to be in, in manual focus. The other thing I would say is if you have a lens with IS or VR or, or optical stabilization, any of those things, you're going to want to turn those off because from, from frame to frame, it might shift slightly a few pixels up or down or left and right. Um, and if you're stacking things in post, that can be problematic. We're going to be on a tripod, so turn off VR. It'll also save your battery life so it doesn't engage that VR motor. Okay? That's kind of a hidden tip there. Um, I would also get rid of UV filters or haze filters. Um, they're not going to help you. I would also get rid of like a circular polarizer unless you have water in the shot and you know why you're using it. But in general, I'd get rid of filters um, for for the night. It it can get moisture build up inside of them. Um, you you can lock up the mirror. Depends on how good your tripod is. Um, a lot of cameras are mirrorless now, so you don't have to do that anymore. Um, I typically don't ah eh, probably 80 percent of the time i don't lock up the mirror because i always forget how um i i don't really i have a really beefy tripod though like i can stand on my tripod um so you know that kind of depends on how much shake you are you're getting um if i had like a 1d or like a really like heavy shutter yeah i'd probably lock it up uh, mirrorless you don't have to worry about it um, the filters that, that that are useful, like I said, there's one that takes out the night sky uh, noise. Uh, it takes out sodium vapor lights, basically. It just doesn't allow that wavelength to come in, and that can be really useful, especially if you're shooting a, around a more urban environment. Um, there's also some filters that, that can help you focus at night. Yeah, that Verlin, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, that's, that's why I say go scout during the day. Get set up at, like, dusk so that you're ready to go where you're not fumbling or, like, forget to, like, tightening your tripod i saw andrew do that one time and watch this camera drop right off the top of his tripod that was fun um that get, got a little heart attack out of that so yeah red lights yeah um your phone a lot of your phones have like a red light setting too um so you don't want to get blinded by um 
Yeah, again, so Charles, that's kind of why I say get set up, get your composition, especially as you're starting out, get your composition set up at like dusk and then wait for the stars to come in. Um, and that's kind of a, a nice, I think that accomplishes a lot of things. One, it's safer. Uh, two, it's easier to see. Uh, it's easier to see kind of what you're doing and get your composition. Um, so I, <laughs> lots of ants. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's no good. Clay, in answer to your question, yeah, um, a lot of a lot of astrophotography that you see is somewhere between like two and like 400 frames. Um, so there's a lot of compos composition, not like framing, but uh, where you're stacking different photos, right? Um, yeah, so... Again, that's why I think it's it's good to get there a little bit early to set up for that. So, yeah, you just you can almost in AV mode as dusk is coming in, you can shoot in AV mode and just let it go for a while. And then once the night skies like lock that exposure into manual, um, but that's kind of a nice way to get a foreground subject. Um, are you talking about like depth of field blending, or are you talking about like a foreground that's got some like dusk exposure against a night Milky Way? Because those are kind of yeah, they're kind of the same thing, but kind of different, Clay. But you just, you know, you just take them into Photoshop. Make sure that you're in Lightroom, that you don't do any, you know, drastic. Um, you want to keep the, you don't really want to do anything with lens correction uh, so that they'll stack right in Photoshop and then blend them and then do your, then bring it back in and do the lens correction afterwards. Um, but you can just paint in, you can layer mask in the foreground. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you can get kind of that dusky, that dusky uh, foreground, so that there's some data in the foreground, and then you just only have to worry about the night sky. Uh, you just don't want to touch your your camera, and that's why remote shutter release comes in very nice. Um, one of the things that the cameras do now as well is that you can um, you can like app with your phone. So if you forget your intervalometer or whatever, you can still interface it in remote shutter release with your phone. So that's nice. You don't want to touch your camera. You don't want to put your fingers on it because you're you're going to shake it even if you don't, even if you're careful. So remote shutter releases is, is very important. <clears throat> so if we're doing star trails, some the, the really key piece of software is star stacks. Um, and it's a, a nice way to blend in um all the stars it's a free software uh, which makes it nice um so basically you want to take your raws get them good you know and then do all your composition in in photoshop but for the star trails the star trail themselves you'll build in star stacks um and then as you're shooting you're going to want to have things like google sky map or photo pills or something like that uh, where you can see like where all the things are going to be in the night sky hold on i'm going to sneeze <coughs> Yeah, that I've I've watched that class, Jim. It's it's a really good class. Yeah, and actually, there's the website, so it's it's in there. Um, the dark sky one is dark sky finder, uh, photo pills, uh, star sex. I like lonely spec a lot. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin. Whoa. Let's begin. Whoa, um, lonely spec uh, has a lot of great tutorials and uh, gear conversation there as well. Um, I'm following one of his tutorials on doing uh, long lens composite compositing where i'm going to try to use my 85 uh shoot it fairly wide open and get some different effects and build a composite out of that so i'm going to do some large format where i'm going to get like you know you know a hundred thousand by eighty thousand pixels or something crazy so, okay y'all want to see some can y'all so i'm gonna show y'all granger lake that we did Can y'all see these photos? Does, did they come up? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so this is Granger Lake from the southeast corner of Granger Lake, just south of the dam. Um, and if you notice the horizon, that's actually Georgetown and Temple that I'm, you're, uh, it's not Temple. It's um, Georgetown and um, Gerald. Um, and, and it's those, those all, the, that light pollution, just to kind of show you what that light pollution looks like. And this, there's, there's no Milky Way here. The Milky Way wasn't up. I couldn't stay awake long enough to shoot the Milky Way that night. It didn't come up to like midnight and I was done. I'd already done three shoots that day. Um, 
but just as an example of kind of what that light pollution can look like. Um, yeah. But that's, that's, you know, shooting into the cities. That's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get, man. But I do a lot of like foreground light painting. So I just have a little Luma cube with a little diffuser that's gelled CTO. And I'm just painting in that foreground. So that's all, that's all in one exposure. Um, and you can also see the plane going across there because I hate planes. That, that, ooh, that bright spot there is Venus. That really, really bright spot is Venus. And then if you want to get real crazy, so if somebody was asking what I use my light wand for, that I use it for that. So, so this is actually the Milky Way here. We're kind of right above their heads. Um, so Milky Way shot. This is outside Denver in September. Um, my my light wand was actually too bright, so I had to take my shirt off and wrap it around my light wand um, so that it would diffuse the light wand enough that it wasn't blowing out my exposure. But then that's me running around them during a 30-second exposure um, as we're painting. So that's all one frame. That's all done in camera. Uh, but there's there's kind of what Colorado looks like night sky. I was topless. Yeah, I do. I do all my work topless, especially in July. They're fully clothed. I'm topless. It helps me think. So you can see, but you can see the Milky Way like as I go. So I was just doing different things. Yeah, see how it was, it was blowing out, and that was at the minimum light setting. So I had a white T-shirt, and I just wrapped it around it so that I diffused it because <laughs> oh, I'm crazy that way. So that's just kind of my base exposure. So there's the Milky Way kind of right above. And I didn't process this too hard. There's just my base exposure so that I knew kind of what my settings were going to be too. But you can see there's like one, two, three planes. Oh, yeah. You want to see the red hearts here? And literally, this is me like running around the park at midnight, topless with a light wand. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Looks cool. Yeah, it was, it was pretty nuts. They just have to hold still. Because that is a 30 second exposure. Um, let's see. So here's one, Andrew. To, oh, so he, here's 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 what Revly Peak looks like. So that's that's Revly Peak. It's pretty cool. Uh, which one did they pick? Uh, I think they picked that first one with the blue, that kind of teal one. Let's see where else. So this is <clears throat> this is out in West Texas. Um, town's called Langtree. It's about an hour past Del Rio, so a lot more. A lot. This is in July, um, so there's a lot more um, detail because the sky's so dark. But see how you kind of get these like greens coming in. There's different gases kind of release at different parts of the night, so you're going to get different stuff. Um, we were out there. We were at that same ranch one time, and I, yeah, I had to. It was so dark. I had to go to like twelve thousand ISO. Like it was. I was shooting at f four, but I mean, it was. It was pretty crazy dark. Um, and then this is this is Joshua Tree. So that all this yellow is. Um, all that yellow is uh, L A. Uh, Milky Way, uh, typically thirty seconds. So there, there's a base exposure, Michelle. It's typically ISO 1600 F4, 30 seconds, tungsten white balance. Um, and then obviously, we're doing some like flashing as well there. Um, this is, I believe this is Enchanted Rock. Yeah, that's, that's Enchanted Rock. And then this one's also Revly Peak Ranch. This was shot with a Pentax 645Z right when it came out. Pretty wild. At the time, I was like, this is amazing. And then they never did anything with it. <laughs> Pentax is such a weird company. I don't understand how they're still in business. But that's Revly Peak. It has all these kind of cool rock features and different things. Um, let me see. I did a cool... So somebody was asking like my 5D3. So this was done with my 5D3 with a 3512. 
I was shooting at F2. I'm sorry, F2. And then I had three flashes firing to get my foreground lit up. But that's what kind of I'm kind of weird that way, and that I I use like external lights to. Um, so here's I'm gonna show you all. Will it play? No, that's a JPEG. I thought I had a uh, I thought I had a time lapse. Maybe I don't. Nope. I thought I had a time lapse. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. So here's a time lapse. So this is Milky Way exposures over an hour. Let's see if we can get it. Can y'all see this playing? Well, it hasn't started playing yet. We're gonna wait a second. Oh, please. So this is this is over like an hour. So those clouds are kind of make it cool. So that's so at twenty four frames a second for ten seconds. That's two hundred and forty exposures, roughly. Uh, Clay, what's setting for the flash strength? Um, you actually need a surprisingly amount of flash, uh, more than you might think you would need. Um, even though you're shooting at like ISO 1600, you're typically covering a great distance. Um, so my flashes are, I'm, I'm usually hitting them pretty hard. If I'm using a speed light, I'm probably around half to quarter power for a speed light. Um, and then like a bigger light, I'm probably like eighth or 16th on a big strobe, roughly. Um, where else? I was gonna show you all another one. Yeah, Joshua Tree is cool. If you ever get a chance, to, if you ever get a chance to go to Joshua Tree, it's a really neat place. Just this virus thing going on. I said, if you ever get a chance, not right now. Uh, we went out to shoot this couple's engagement photos out there, <laughs> and we're at Joshua Tree, and it's like. It was like 60 mile an hour winds that day. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was so windy. I, I don't know that I've ever been in a place trying to shoot where it was that windy, but like that was the only time we had. And like we had to go and we had no choice in the matter. And it was just, man, we were just trying to find places to shoot. So that was like 2015, 2014. Um, mm -mm. And then, yeah, for, for me, I like, I like doing a lot of, um, I like doing a lot of like flashes or composites and things like that. But again, I'm kind of crazy. That's definitely an advanced technique using flashes on top of everything else. But yeah, I think this is going to, if you go to Granger, which is pretty close, um, there's an observation deck on the Southeast corner. Um, and I think that that corner facing east would be a good composition because you have this like mountain of rocks that might uh, around the dam might be pretty neat. If it loads, I'm in the back. There you go. So that could be a cool composition with the Milky Way rising. But underneath this tree are the bathrooms right there at the observation deck. Um, but that could be a cool composition. And that's just a little Luma cube, just a one inch light that I'm just kind of waving around a little bit just to, to lighten up my foreground. So because I don't want to have to composite if I don't have to. <laughs> Compositing takes a while. Yeah. So let me exit out of screen share here. Um, and then let me, uh, let me answer y'all's questions. So like some things I think that might be a good question, like how do you focus in the dark? Um, generally, you want to focus on the star. So typically, hopefully your lens has a distance meter <laughs> and you can set it to infinity because uh, generally you're going to want to set it at you know, to get the stars in focus. But also manual focusing is kind of the way to go. Um, and to do that, a trick, you just crank your ISO really, really high. Um, and then you can use shorter exposure times to check your focus. Uh, so that's kind of a nice trick. So instead of, you know, 1600, throw it up as high as it'll go. The, 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 the file will be terrible. But instead of having a 30 second exposure, you might only have a two and a half second exposure. And all you're doing is just to check to see your focus. Um, the other thing you can do if you have a partner, have them shine, have them shine a light at something uh, to help you focus on that as well. Uh, we do. That's I think another reason to go in a buddy system is um, you can help you can help each other focus your cameras. 
I just, we just shine a flashlight or something so that we can zoom in, go to 10 X optical view, or I mean, 10 X live view. Um, and then you can kind of dial in your focus that way. Okay. What questions do you have about shooting Astro tripod recommendations? Um, for tripods, I, I, I would recommend something that has a leveling base to it. Uh, cause you don't want to be fiddling with legs and at night. So something that has where you can get close with the legs and then at the stem, do some focusing, uh, do some leveling. That's going to make your life so much easier. Um, you know, you don't need a carbon fiber tripod, but you want something sturdy enough to, sturdy enough to hold your camera. Do I have my tripod? Not in this room. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lewis, that's And that's kind of why I say, like, get set up at dusk. Um, it's just so much easier than, um, yeah. Yeah. A headlight is always useful. Yeah. And a headlight that goes to red is really useful. Yes. So that's actually why I like the white one. I can turn it down really low and turn it to red. <laughs> and then I have it because then I'm usually light painting with it as well. Oh, that's what I was going to show you. The, I know I was going to show you. <clears throat> I was going to show you how I use the light one with star trails because, you know. I feel like Gosh, I've, you're yeah. at F4 on talking about F4. Is that just because that's the fast as the lens was? Uh, or are you stopping down for some reason? That's just my starting spot. A lot of the wide angle zooms are F4, um, but but depth of field, uh, vignetting as well. Um, even if a lens goes to 2.8, a lot of times the vignetting is so bad you don't want to shoot at 2.8. Um, I just find lenses sharper at f4 than at 2.8. It's it's actually a little easier to go up in. Um, uh, it's just a little bit easier to go up in uh, ISO than it is to like mess with focus. It just gives me a little more wiggle room as well. I'm not perfect on focus. So, yeah, I mean, those are all. Some of it is personal taste, like knowing your lens, knowing your gear, like what you feel comfortable with. Um, my lens, like. My lens at f4 is pretty. Oh, here I'll show you the first one I ever did. Uh, here, let me screen share again real quick. Where'd I go? There we go. So this is, um, this is Colorado Bend, um, painting. I don't even remember what I had to light paint with, but this was shot with my 15 mil fisheye, uh, where I defished a little bit, um. But I was there to shoot a, a night trail race. I was like, oh, look, the Milky Way. And so this is like right where the springs flow into the river. Um, but this was shot on my Canon 5D Mark II uh, back in 2012. So it gets a little noisy. I was, I was at like 3200 ISO. And that was a great camera. But past 16, it got a little wonky. Yeah. So there's that one somewhere. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Ah, so this is who is somebody's asking about Pernell's Falls. So this will answer two questions. So this was done at Pernell's uh, by the swimming hole. And this is all one exposure done with that Savage RGB light wand. So I'm changing the colors as I'm running around, but this is all done in 30 seconds. That's neat. Yeah. I, I like getting my workout in at night where I, um, my feet were actually bleeding by the end of this. The sand was so rough and I took my shoes off because they were getting in everywhere. Uh, and I was running around so hard for like an hour that my feet were bleeding by the end of that shoot. So this this is in the same spot, um, but this is all one exposure done with just that little light wand. You can't really see it, but like the the river is real smooth because it's a long exposure as well. So that's kind of a, a neat side effect as you get those real smooth water because you're averaging out the water height over time. I was trying to find I did a light painting Thanksgiving. Come on. There we go. So here's a here's an example where I combine star trails and foreground light painting with the light wand. 
So for those of y'all, that's so that foreground is one frame, and then the star trails are like another seventy-five frames. So I averaged out the star trails, got that, and then foreground, and then I layer masked in the background, and that was shot at yeah, I was at sixteen hundred f four, thirty seconds times seventy-five exposures. Yeah, and then so that camera was fa facing north. And then I had another camera facing south. So I had one facing north, one facing south. So same road. They're about 100 yards apart. So I didn't contaminate the photos, but same process. So this was shot with a little bit longer focal length. So the stars look more um, longer. They look longer and less staccato. But that's how I use the light one when I'm doing this type of thing. Yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> when you say a longer focal length, what do you mean, Josh? Uh, so like that red and blue one was shot at 35 mil. Um, the other one, the orange and green one was shot at 16 mil. Um, and as you get longer focal lengths or star trails, you, you, you can do them in less time because you're shooting a smaller piece of the sky, so the apparent motion of the Earth's rotation is faster. Anybody's brain feel like it's gonna explode yet? Was that too much math? Yeah, four frame 35, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four frame 35. What other questions y'all got? What can I answer for you? Um, yeah, and a cheap, anything you can lock your shutter with for star trails. I have a cheap $8 Amazon uh, remote shutter and I have a $70 Canon one. Um, they work exactly the same for me. <laughs> so um, you don't have to spend a lot for the remote shutter release, but I think it's really important to have one. The foreign language that I'm talking in, did I, did I forget to speak English today? Did I start speaking Spanish for no reason? Lo siento. <laughs> it's fun. You know, and I, I think kind of the why to do Milky Way, at least in Texas, it's hot during the day. Um, yeah, I do. Better than Vogon poetry. Um, it's so hot during the day that it's really nice to shoot Milky Ways at night. Because that's about all you want to shoot in Texas in the summer. Everything else is just too hot to go out and do. Um, that's why I shoot underwater in the summer as well, because it's the only thing that's temperature that I actually want to shoot. Everything else, everybody's just sweaty anyway. Um, I'm not speaking engineer. Um, so, yeah, what other questions? Come on, I know you got some. Oh, also with the basic camera settings, a lot of it depends also on uh michelle maybe i'll let everybody know tomorrow maybe i don't know yet it's it's oscillated so texas weather it may all peter out um but the other thing like the closer you are to center city centers the less your exposure is going to be um it also depends on like new moon or not so if it's new moon uh you're going to need more exposure um, if you're not new moon, you're going to need a little bit less exposure. We were at Enchanted Rock one time at uh, at full moon, and our exposures were like two seconds. Um, you know, ISO 1600, and we were getting hard shadows because the moon was so bright. So it just depends on where you are. Um, but I think that's just a good starting point. And if you need the other reason I like shooting at f4 or starting at f4 and 1600 is because it gives me it gives me some levers to pull if that's not enough. So if it's still too dark at that exposure, um, then I can just I can drop down to two eight if I need to, or I can bump up to thirty two and I feel safe. Um, so that's kind of my like middle of the road exposure. Yeah, please text me in the middle of the night. Actually, my phone goes into do not disturb mode after eleven, so you're not going to get me anyway. <laughs> Hi, Sabrina. Are you here, Sabrina? I don't see her name. 
I'm, I'm just giving her a shout out. Uh, right. I want to thank like everyone. Here. I don't know. We have we had 25 participants, and uh, she's our latest member. I was hoping she'd be here. Yeah, and, I was hoping Brian would be here too. But. And Brian Nixon is a, a renewal after a year of absence, so that's really cool. If you yeah. have friends uh, who you think would benefit from our club, uh, you can invite them to this um, third Thursday. Uh, just share the link with them. And um, is Mark able to tell us anything about the contest? We have an open theme. Mark? He's getting his mic, it looks like. Or he went to sleep because his mic went, his camera went it, dark. His camera went dark, his connection speed. Well, Ed could also say he's got the page set up so you can submit photos now. Yeah, actually, Mark did that. Okay, Array Mark. Yeah, hey, Mark. So, uh, yeah, maybe some Astro uh, Galaxy pictures. Yeah. Sure. Also, also, I think we need to have a photo club beard competition. Beard <laughs> looks like there's Mark is definitely in. in I think the lead. yeah, I think Mark's in the lead. That's that's not fair. I cut mine off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to get my I need to get my woolly man going again. We we need to start from scratch. I'm kind, I always thought I was half chia pit. <laughs> I mean, I, no, not no beer competition. <laughs> uh, let me just say on behalf of the club how much we appreciate Josh doing the presentation. Oh, if, yeah. you, if you all uh, think this is a great presentation, everybody should clap. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for stepping up. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to post an another link real quick. Mm -hmm. this up this weekend. I have a I have a podcast now. What's up? So make 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 podcast.com. We're now on Spotify and iTunes. What what? So, we have yeah. a uh, we have a program committee. This uh, Alan Irby and Bill Bunton and yeah. uh, Bill, you're here. Tell us uh, if you have anything you want us to know. Ideas for programs uh, are always welcome. May not be able to. We, we according to Alan, we've got some some leads for later in the year, and we are talking to the church about maybe. The third Thursday in June might might be a face to face meeting, um, but we've talked about our last leadership meeting um, was also recognizing we could invite speakers from from different places and do another Zoom meeting like this. So, but Bill, do you have anything you want to say about the program? Yes, uh, uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to get Mandy. She just continues to have uh, lots of fun issues in her life. Life. She had a laptop, laptop failed on her last month, and then this week she got dog bit pretty seriously, major puncture wounds. Uh, I was kind of expecting to see her show up tonight on the list, and she didn't. Yeah. Josh and I talked about another opportunity, and Patty and Ann have both kind of asked about it. So I think uh, tentatively we'll, and I'll get you a, an abstract bio for this is we'll do a virtual studio uh, simulated lighting tour. And I'll do that, do some lighting scenarios, kind of the classic ones. And then I'll give everybody a point of where we can uh, get the trial version of the, the program. So it simulates studio strobes, speed lights, and continuous lights. And so far with my few exercises I've done on it, it's it's an impressive tool. Yeah, it is. And uh, I'll do that. I'm also going to contact the vendor and see if we can get a discount code for it. Cool. So yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. And also, I mean, this is a member run club. So if there are people that y'all think we should go after, just message Bill or message Alan or message me and we'll go go find them. Like, I don't know if y'all remember, but two years ago, we brought in Rick Salmon to come and talk. Right. So like we can we can pull some stuff together. Um, so if there's people that y'all admire, let us know and we'll try to reach out. I mean, the worst they're going to get, you know, the worst they're going to say is no. 
And, you know, I'm pretty used to getting told no. So next worst is they put their hand out. Yeah. We, we, we do have a budget uh, we could for small handouts. Yeah. We well, need to, uh, we need to figure out where where we want to do, put that. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, I would choose carefully where we spend money. Yeah, but I mean, if it's if it's if it's something that we think it has value to everybody in the club, then yeah, we'll yeah. go after them. But yeah, send suggestions. Uh, all right, we can't. We we don't know everything. We just know most things. So help us fill in the gaps. We try. <laughs> hey, so David, I I saw I just saw your text. So that's not motion, because um, if you look at the center of your frame, um, it actually is sharp. Um, what you, it's just that's that's part of your that wide angle lens. Uh, and that's that coma. We're in the corners. It's not rendering uh, circles as circles. It's rendering circles as over as ovals. Um, and so that that that's just the characteristics of the uh, of that lens you're using. Uh, but it's not anything to do with the shutter speed. You could take that same shot at half the shutter speed and double the ISO, and it would look just the same because it's just a characteristic of your lens. While we're sitting here, does anybody have any particular thing they would like to see in the virtual studio? Hey, Bill, can you show me how to light? <laughs> how to light? Of course. Yeah, yeah, maybe just like one speed light with like a shoot-through umbrella. We can do that. <laughs> I haven't tried simulating my last competition image, though. <laughs> Next time we get together, I want to show you. I have two shoot-through umbrellas. I have a clean one when I want clean light. And I have this, like, dirty, nasty, like, weathered shoot-through. But I actually like it because it's it, it makes things, I don't know, it just has a certain characteristic. But, like, I pull it out and they're like, ew. But it actually kind of throttles light a little differently. Anyway, so I keep it around. It has, like, spilled chocolate on it. <laughs> it's pretty bad. <laughs> uh Anybody gonna go out and shoot anything? What are we? What are y'all gonna go shoot? Yeah. You take plans. I just campus. found out I have a four day weekend. I got to shoot something. Yeah. And I may yeah. get tired of the inside of the garage. <laughs> yeah. Y'all want to see how bored I got? Go for it. Yeah. Right. So y'all know I get bored. Birds? No, not this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually shoot some birds, but no. How about that? We like that? Oh, oh nice. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So that's a that's the agapanthus um growing in my front yard. So here's another version of it. How'd you get the dark background? Yeah. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> and so here's another version of it. Cool. So they're actually blue, but I was using three gelled strobes. To make think like a theater light on the flowers. Yeah. How much did you have to pay the fly to model? <laughs> the spider? The spider, whatever it was. Yeah. Were you topless? I hope you got a model release. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, the signature is really small though. <laughs> Here, I'll show you. What, I'll, I'll show you what it looked like from from my cell phone point of view. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Mm. Mm. So that wasn't a night shot? No, it was like 10 in the morning. Are you sure those tripods will hold the speed lights? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was Mrs. Kravitz saying across the street? <laughs> so so <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason everything goes dark um, those lights are only like a foot away from the light. And so the fall off is so fast that by the time th that light is reaching the background, it's, it's already it's already decayed three or four times. Right. So if we think of like the half life of light. Right. Um, as they're closer, you're increasing the half lives. Um, and so, you know, only like a 16th of the amount of light is hitting the background versus what's hitting the foreground. Um, yeah. so so one of those lights is pink, one's green, one's orange. And so when they come together, they're actually white. And then when any, any two hit, it's a mix of those two colors. Where zero hit, you get black. Um, and where only one hits, you get just that color. 
So that's why, even though those are kind of purple and blue agapanthus, uh, I was on eighth power, I think. It, but I was at F8. So if I'd gone to F11, I would have been at quarter power. And I was shooting a macro lens, 100 millimeter macro at F8. Um, but I was I was shooting maybe, you know, a couple inches away from the flower. So they're my favorite where, flowers. Where's the camera? Uh, you were hand holding. Yeah, yeah, I was shooting oh. at like one two hundredth. Yeah, I can hand hold one two hundredth pretty easy. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was ISO two hundred one two hundredth f eight, and the flashes are like eighth power. But the good thing about using three flashes, um, no one flash has to do all the work. So none of them have to be at full power. They can all be a little bit less. So you get a little bit faster recycle time out of it as well. So. And your flash duration is so short, you don't have to worry about camera motion. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Flash duration is like uh, one eight thousandth or something crazy like that. Like it's super quick. Yeah. Anybody else have pictures to show? Want to share this? Share their screen. Uh, Show us a picture. A second. And if you go to my Instagram, you can see all my voyeur photos as well. While I was shooting in ba the back of people's windows. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you wanted to share, Bill? Uh, I've got to get Lightroom up, Ed. Well, I'm, uh, I can make you the presenter if you want to share. Uh, if I find an image, I will ask. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it's the only thing you could be doing is like cleaning your gear, um, or getting your like monitors calibrated. Now's a great time to get your monitors calibrated, um, or getting your camera calibrated. This is a great time to do all that kind of stuff right now as well. Yeah, so, I, I just uh, calibrated four cameras, and I think you had mentioned that. Uh, your camera had a the blue was low on it mm -hmm. all four cameras of mine it boosted the blue yeah yeah well it makes landscape so much easier because you get all the blue channels correct yeah what do you shoot with it i don't even know i've got nikon uh, z7 and a d850 and then i've got a uh, a couple of point and shoots that i calibrated nice yeah it makes a it makes a big difference big difference when you start editing you bought your own calibration, Ed. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, the uh, X right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll type it. So for the cameras, it's the X right color checker passport. Yes. And then for the monitors, it's like I one studio for photographers or something like that. And that's for the monitor. And for monitors, you can do them every quarter. You'll be fine. But 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 monitors do age. Uh, they over time they do lose brightness and they do lose color accuracy. So you know, just every time you get an oil change, calibrate your monitor and you'll you'll be a lot better. I just had to go buy more printer ink, and that was a fun purchase. Oh my gosh, I forgot how expensive. <laughs> I bought three cartridges of Epson ink, and it was one hundred eighty one dollars. <laughs> Also, does anybody like Moab paper? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I'm trying to get it to work. I, I've been testing it, and I can't get the profiles to work. I don't know if it's me or them. Whenever I do the uh, paper comparison thing, I've got a bunch of Moab paper in that. Yeah. Which ones do you have? Which ones do you like? Uh, I like the, uh, oh, gosh, it's been so long. What is it? The uh, Pearl? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Right, exactly. Yeah, that's my it's, favorite. Yeah. It's so shiny. That's true. It reminds me of my skin when I was 13, just that glistening. Just... Well, I also use uh, Epson Velvet Fine Art Paper. Yeah, I just printed a whole. Hold on. Yes. I'm like a foot away from my printer right now. Yeah, I just printed a whole, my whole series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that whole, that whole series is done on uh, Epson Velvet Fine Art. I love it. Yeah, it's good paper. 
Yeah, I like the um, the Barita. The Legacy Barita is is another one of my favorite papers. The Epson Legacy Barita. Um, it's real, real nice. There, there's another Legacy ones. I need to get the sampler pack and try them out. Um, and then the the cold press uh, natural I like a lot as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a whole rabbit hole to go through. Like what papers you like? Oh my gosh, it's right. It starts getting into like wine connoisseur. You're like, well, I really like the age of the of the 2019 Epson. You know, <laughs> velvet, velvet fine art. But you know, sometimes I break out the 2012 cold press bright. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, so yeah. Just, I, I think I've said this before, and I, I got to check on the code. Um, I think it's Snap Um For all of our classes at Precision that I teach, uh, I take money out of my pocket to give y'all a discount. If there's anything that I'm teaching, and I think it's NAPFS 19. I think it gives you 10% off. I think. If it, if it doesn't work, call Casey and yell at him. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I told him to take it out of my pocket so that y'all could get a benefit. Do we have a discount on uh, other merchandise there? I do. <laughs> uh, no, otherwise, otherwise, no. Yeah, I paid full uh, boat on an x right color checker, but what a difference that's made in my wildlife stuff. I'm not jacking around with color at all anymore. Yeah, it's, it, makes, it makes editing faster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I don't. I don't have to do as much to my files because I'm. They're they're already right. Is anybody here uh, watching a member of the Adobe User Group, the Austin Adobe User Group? Mm. Go to their meetings. They have a discount through Adobe, but um, I was going to talk to them one time, see what they said about sharing. Yeah, I mean, you think you know? I mean, you know, we have what seventy members now. I mean, it's worth throwing out stuff before all this hit i was in talks with zenfolio to give us a bunch of swag um and she emailed me a week ago she's like we'll get to y'all but like we're in crisis management mode right now um but i started telling her about the club she's like yeah that's absolutely who we want to get in front of so i mean like if there's brands y'all like as well send them like if there's things y'all want to try to get discounts on i mean again all they can do is say no but i'm happy to go ask people um i'll turn on my southern charm and sweet talk them a little bit um i mean i don't know what the adobe might do but you know if there's other brands let me know and i'll, I'll go talk to them yeah talking about shooting birds there is like a yellow billed night heron in my neighborhood that i'm gonna go try to shoot the next day or two cool. and for the i saw uh, uh, like five common nighthawks. Those things were cool. Nighthawks are cool. That's a yellow crowned night heron. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Just like babies and dogs, right? <laughs> it looks cool. No, no, no. I, was wait I was waiting for you to correct him. <laughs> uh, but the bad part is, I knew it was wrong when I said it. I was waiting to see who was going to correct me first. Well, I prefer to shoot dove and quail. Yeah, yeah. With a gun, yeah. I take quail over just about anything. Yeah, our neighborhood's crazy. Uh, Kathy Smith actually lives in my neighborhood as well. Um, we live like 10 houses apart. Oh, I just figured that out. Um, but we have night herons, uh, green herons, and uh, blue herons all in our, like, that haunt in our neighborhood creek. So if anybody wants to do, like, and we have um, not shrikes, but uh, not whippoorwills. What's the other one? I don't know, those little like sandpiper looking ones. Um, and then we have a uh, two uh, big uh, white egrets in our neighborhood as well. So, and some very aggressive ducks. And they, <laughs> they, want, they want your bread. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone wants to shoot, just let me know. Well, I know where they eat and stuff. Dave, I, I mean, sorry, Josh, I want to shoot. Okay, come on over. <laughs> you know where I live. Sort of. Just, just text me at midnight before you come over. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you ever need my address, you can just Google Azul Ox, which is the name of our company, and it gives you my home address as well. So please, please use that power for good. <laughs> Don't. If you're bringing a pie, that's good. Um, if you're bringing me like broken camera gear, not so good. 
Anything else anybody got? Thanks so much for doing this, Josh. Yeah, yeah, happy to help. I know yeah, with corn just throwing everybody for a loop. So anyway, we can help. You know, I'm always I'm always here. Y'all know that. Mm. Yeah, I think Ed, I think I think you need to do a printing class too. Or somebody uh, does. Okay. <laughs> somebody not somebody not me needs to do a printing class. <laughs> I heard Ed. I heard Ed too. <laughs> uh -oh. you don't, okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> you don't want me doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I think you've been at it a while, Ed, if I memory serves me. Yeah, I've been printing. Uh, I've got quite a few printers, or had quite a few printers anyway. I decided to buy a new print box. I was running out of space to put them all. Mm. Mm. Ah. All right, guys. Well, y'all have a great, y'all have a great I found night. It, Ed. Oh, oh, wait. We got a photo from Bill. <laughs> Emergency <laughs> photo from Bill. Yeah. Okay. All we'll right. Light room here. You can present anytime you're ready. Got to find the button, Ed. Down near the bottom. Looks sure. like a three-sided yeah. box with an air up pointing arrow. There Good we go. go. It's thinking. Oh, wait, where'd light go? Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. <laughs> there we go. Now, if it'll go full screen, it would be nice. Here we go. There you go. Oh, nice. Yeah. There it is. It looks great. Look at, all, look at all those lovely planes in the sky, bastards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see four. Maybe it's a space station. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Seems like we got had one where it was the space station. But. Yeah, it's quite possible. It goes by like every ninety minutes. <laughs> this is the side of this barn that is rarely seen. Everybody photographs it from the other side. Mm -hmm. And this will have to be different. Say again. Bill has to be different. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> so well, where is this? Big Ben, uh, Montana. Where are we at? The Tetons. This is Grand Tetons, Mormon Row. Okay. Let's see if I've got uh, one of the others there. So here's a what's 71. This is Big Ben. Oh, yeah. There you go. See, damn those planes. <laughs> <laughs> this is one I like. Yeah. Just driving out across the middle of the park early in the morning. Nice. Yep. Just a few clouds out there to spice up the horizon. Yeah, you know, a little bit of low lying clouds, you know, can it really add, I think, uh, to the composition, um, especially when you start shooting crazy, like wide, you know, if you're like at 11 or 12, or like 14, like super wide, uh, it can really make some dramatic things happen. Yeah, Josh showed off his first uh, Milky Way shot. Here's mine. There you go. Yeah. What was interesting about this is there were several other photographers out there and the first frame everybody got back was wow <laughs> well yeah you know and that's the thing that milky way can do right our eyes can't stay open for 30 seconds right whereas a camera can so if we really think of cameras as time dilation tools uh, it kind of opens up some new possibilities right this is uh the mouth of Santa Elena Canyon. So the sandbar the photographer's own is US. The rock is Mexico. Hmm. Yep. <coughs> cool. 
that's what I've got, Ed. Okay. Cool, cool. Yeah, and you're at 15. Yeah. 15, 30 seconds, 2 8. I said 2,000. Right. Yeah, so yeah, you're right there. Yeah. It, it's just the same numbers, you know, same basic numbers you were presenting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, everybody's camera is a little different and everybody's lenses are a little bit different. Um, you know, I don't know if y'all know this, but F stop is theoretical um, and T stop is actual. Um, so in the cinema world, they use T stops, which they measure the actual light transmission of the lens. Um, so a lot of lenses that say they're 2.8 aren't they? Well, nothing transmits exactly 2.8. Um, that's all theoretical, um, but they vary. Um, so like there are some that T stops are like 2.9, 3.1. Um, there are some that, that advertises F 2.8, but their T stops like 3.5. Um, so really knowing your gear, uh, can go a long way to know how much light actually gets to the sensor. You know, this this is just super lens. Yeah, and th and that's why you spend more for some lenses, like some like some of the cheap Rokinons. I did one, and it was a fourteen. It was a fourteen two eight, but it was a the cinema version. It had gears on it, and it was actually like a three five. Mm -hmm. um, so it was almost a stop darker in transmission versus what it, it could have been. But it was only a three hundred dollar lens versus the Canon version that's like fifteen hundred. So. That's kind of what you're paying for sometimes is you're getting closer to the theoretical limit of how much light actually comes through a, a lens all the way to your sensor. And then some it comes only in the center, some goes covers the entire frame. So that that throws a part in it as well. Um lenses, and that's why like, you know, a two eight lens at f4 is gonna have a flatter field of exposure uh, you know, than a, a two eight lens at two eight, right? You're gonna get more vignetting in the corners. <coughs> Excuse me, I can't find the mute button for the mic as a presenter. Mm. Oh, it's yeah, I don't know. My, my, my microphone has a mute. so. Um, but, yeah, that's why I like knowing your gear and experimenting and kind of seeing what you get. Uh, but in general, start off at 1,600 at 4, 30 seconds, and then if you need more, go to 3,200. If you need more than that, drop to 2,8 more, go to 64. You can always, you can always um, run, run your photos through software to get rid of noise. Uh, you can't get rid of shake, right? You can't get rid of, you know, if you're boosting up your shadows a whole bunch, that's going to be worse. So get, get your exposure right and cameras close, and that's going to make your software run easy. Cool. Awesome. Another meeting done before 9 o'clock? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, if, you have, if, you have, if you have a noise software... Um, uh, I mean, Lightroom's is probably the worst. <laughs> Photoshop's is a little bit better, and then there's some plugins. Um, so Nick FX has a noise plugin. Um, what's the other one? There's like a, it's not Noise Ninja. Noise Ninja used to be the good one, but it's not anymore. Topaz. There's some, yeah, the Topaz one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Topaz Denoise. Yeah, that's probably the best one out there right now. You're. you're are you saying that Topaz is better than Nick? Uh, at this point, yeah. Because well, Nick just got updated, and I haven't tested it. But Nick had okay. an update; they hadn't updated their software in like four or five years. And Topaz is their their more current release is more recent. Topaz is so doing more uh, AI um, in their yeah. and then they're um, sharpening. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in the last year that Topaz has passed Nick. Maybe 18 months ago, they passed them Some, somewhere in there. Whatever their latest release is, that their Topaz's latest generation is better than Nick's. But Nick's is better than Lightroom. Lightroom's is terrible. I don't, I don't ever push Lightroom past 20 on 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 luminance or chrominance. 